Sri Bhagawan Ramana Maharshi's teachings on self-liberation. The illusion created by the mind must be destroyed by the mind itself. Your duty is to be and not to be this or that. I am that I am sums up the whole truth. The method is summed up in the words, be still. Stillness means destroy yourself. Every name and form is the cause of trouble. Give up the notion, I am so and so. All that we have to do is to give up identifying the self with the body, with forms and limits, and then we shall know ourselves, the self that we always are. Do not associate with the mind that rises like the goddess who smites one with love. Destroy it by abiding in the self. Should you succumb to its spell and embrace it, alas, it will destroy your life by drowning you in the intoxication of pride. That demon, the mind, is extremely adept at amorously caressing you with false pretenses. Heed this warning. From now on, Stay away from that utterly sinful one without even mentioning its name. The mind is a great demon whose embrace brings death to all. It somehow deceives everyone and brings them under its spell. It is an extremely cunning trickster, a thief who practices deception. This murderer, this beautiful and seductive one, is a despicable sinner who has totally ruined the lives of many an aspirant. It is an evil, low-born one who hates and torments your lawfully wedded one. Peace.
one who is forgetful of the self, mistaking the physical body for it, and goes through innumerable births, is like one who wanders all over the world in a dream. Thus, realizing the self would only be like waking up from the dream wanderings. Know that the path of knowledge and the path of devotion are interrelated. Follow these inseparable two paths without dividing one from the other. The lazy state, wherein you exist motionlessly and shine, is the natural state. In that supreme state, you have become that. It cannot be attained except by direct, excellent and rare austerities. You should therefore honour those who are established in that laziness as holy beings. Bliss is a thing which is always there and is not something that comes and goes. That which comes and goes is a creation of the mind and you should not worry about it. An eye rises forth with every thought and with its disappearance that eye disappears too. Many eyes are born and die every moment. The subsisting mind is the real trouble. That is the thief Find him out and you will be happy. During worldly activity, if your attention is fixed on the fundamental reality, there is no difficulty. But ordinary people forget the reality and take the name alone to be real.
the different eyes are not real. There is only one eye. The separate eye is like a watchman in a fort. He is like the protector of the body. The real owner in everybody is only the one real I. So when the separate eye surrenders to the real eye, then because the idea of a separate self who owns the body disappears, I and mine are eliminated. The true state comes into existence when, after sorting out what belongs to whom, the ego I surrenders itself to the real owner. Many fear that with the destruction of the mind, they themselves will cease to exist. But destruction of the mind is nothing to be feared. What we conceive of now as mind is only a combination of restlessness and dullness. By their elimination, the mind becomes pure. Such a mind is one's own real nature. One who considers the body to be themselves is an ignorant person. One who regards himself as the self is the enlightened one who has realized the self. The one self, the sole reality alone exists 
eternally. When even the ancient teacher, Dakshinamurti, revealed it through speechless eloquence, who else could convey it by speech? Since past and future have never been without the present, to know the eternal now is to know the truth. The changeless, infinite self transcends time and space which are relative to the body and the mind. The sage who has realized the self transcends both free will and destiny, with which only the ignorant are concerned. To the ignorant, the I is the self limited to the body, to the wise, the I is the infinite self. Though the non-dual knowledge is difficult to attain, it becomes easy to attain when the true love for the feet of the Lord becomes intense, since its grace, the revealing light which dispels ignorance, then begins to flow. If the agent upon whom the karma depends, namely the ego, merges in its source and loses its form, how can the karma which depends upon it survive? When there is no I, there is no karma. Only when the self is gained is permanent, perfect, blissful peace attained. In this self-sovereignty, non-dual, heaven-like, or pervasive, no desire and no fear can exist.
beyond the reach of words extends the sage's greatness. None but them can know their state of being, vaster than the sky, to experience it yourself. You should first shed your own body consciousness. One who turns inward with an untroubled mind to search where the consciousness I arises realizes the self and rests in that like a river when it joins the ocean. To all deep thinking minds, the inquiry about the I and its nature has an irresistible fascination. Call it by any name, God, self, the heart, or the seat of consciousness. It is all the same. The point to be grasped is this, that heart means the very core of one's being, the centre without which there is nothing whatsoever. When the mind unceasingly investigates its own nature, it transpires that there is no such thing as mind. This is the direct path to truth for all. The mind is merely thoughts. Of all thoughts, the thought I is the root. Therefore, the mind is only the thought I. Whence does this I arise? Seek for it within. It then vanishes. This is the pursuit of wisdom. This is always the true import 
of the term I. For we do not cease to exist, even in the deepest sleep, where there is no waking I. As there is no second being to know that which is, that which is, is consciousness. We are that. The state we call realisation is simply being oneself, not knowing anything or becoming anything. If one is realised, they are that which alone is and which alone has always been. They cannot describe that state. They can only be that. Of course, we loosely talk of self-realization for want of a better term. That which is, is peace. All that we need do is to keep quiet. Peace is our real nature. We spoil it. What is required is that we cease to spoil it. For instance, there is space in a hall. We are not going to create space anew. We fill up the place with various articles. If we want space, all that we need do is to remove all those articles and we get space. Similarly, if we remove all the rubbish from the mind, the peace will become manifest. That which is obstructing the peace must be removed. Peace is the only reality. liberation is our nature. 
it is another name for us. Our wanting mukti is a very funny thing. It is like a man who is in the shade, voluntarily leaving the shade, going into the sun, feeling the severity of the heat, making great efforts to get back into the shade and then rejoicing. At last, I have reached the shade. How sweet is the shade. We are doing exactly the same. We are not different from the reality. We imagine we are different. We create the feeling of difference and then undergo great suddenness to get rid of the imagined differences and realize the oneness. Why imagine or create the differences and then destroy it? It is false to speak of realization. What is there to realize? The real is as it is ever. How to realize it? All that is required is this. We have realized the unreal, regarded as real what is unreal. We have to give up this attitude. That is all that is required for us to attain jnana. We are not creating anything new or achieving something which we did not have before. Effortless and choiceless awareness is our real state. If we can attain it or be in it, it is all right. But one cannot reach it without effort. The effort of deliberate meditation. All the age-long vasanas, latent tendencies, carry the mind outwards and turn it to external objects. All such thoughts have to be given up and the mind turned inward. 
For most people, effort is necessary. Be quiet or still, but it is not easy. That is why all this effort is necessary. Even if you find one who has effortlessly achieved the mona or silence or supreme state, you may take it that the effort necessary has already been completed in a previous life. Such effortless and choiceless awareness is reached only after deliberate meditation. We are always the real, and what is there for one to attain after that? What is changing? What appears and disappears? What is not real, we regard as real. We are always, and nothing can be more directly present than we. We say we have to attain realization after all these sadhanas or practices. Nothing can be more strange than this. The self is not attained by doing anything other than remaining still and being as we are. We say that what we see with the eyes alone is directly present. There must first be the seer before anything could be seen. You are yourself the eye that sees. The infinite eye. People are afraid 
that when the ego or the mind is killed, the result may be a mere blank and not happiness. What really happens is that the thinker, the object of thought and thinking all merge into the one source which is consciousness and bliss itself and thus that state is neither inert nor blank. I do not understand why people should be afraid of that state in which all thoughts cease to exist and the mind is killed. Every day they experience that state in sleep. There is no mind or thought in sleep. Yet when one rises from sleep, one says, I slept happily. Sleep is so dear to everyone that no one, prince or beggar, can do without it. What happens when you make a serious quest for the self is that the I thought as a thought disappears. Something else from the depths takes hold of you and that is not the I which commenced the quest. That is the real self, the import of I. It is not the ego, nor the mind. It is the Supreme Being itself. The very fact that you are possessed of the quest of the self is a manifestation of the divine grace. It is effulgent in the heart, the inner being, the real self. It draws you from within. You have to attempt to get in from without. Your attempt is earnest quest. The deep inner movement is grace. That is why I say there is no real inquiry without grace. Nor is their grace active for one who is without inquiry. Both are necessary.
The ego self is the jiva. It is different from the Lord of all, the absolute. When through disinterested devotion, the individual self approaches the Lord, it graciously assumes name and form and takes the self into itself. Therefore, they say the Guru is none other than the Lord. They are a human embodiment of the Divine Grace. The real Guru is God in human form. Knowing oneself is only being oneself, as there is no second existence. This is self-realization. You may go on reading any number of books on Vedanta. They can only tell you, realize the self. The self cannot be found in books. You have to find it for yourself, in yourself. quest for the self I speak of is a direct method, indeed superior to the other meditations. For the moment you get into a movement of quest for the self and go deeper and deeper the real self is waiting there to take you in. And then whatever is done, is done by something else, and you have no hand in it. In this process, all doubts and discussions are automatically given up, just as one who sleeps forgets, for the time being, all their cares.
the Lord whose home is the interior of the heart lotus and who shines there as I is extolled as the Lord of the cave. If by force of practice the feeling I am that, I am the Lord of the cave becomes firmly established and thus you stand forth as the Lord of the cave. The illusion that you are the perishable body will vanish like darkness before the rising sun. If we regard ourselves as the doers of action, we shall also be the enjoyers of the fruits of such action. If by inquiring who does these actions, one realizes oneself, the sense that one is the doer vanishes and with it all the three kinds of karma. This is the state of eternal mukti or liberation. Our real nature is mukti, but we imagine that we are bound and are making strenuous attempts to become free, while we are all the time free. This will only be understood when we reach that stage. We will be surprised that we were frantically trying to attain something which we have always been and are. The dyads, or the pairs of opposites, such as pleasure and pain, and the triads, or such differences as the knower, the known, and the process of knowing, depend on one thing, the ego. When one seeks for that thing in the heart and finds out its real nature, they will vanish.
those alone who have found out the real nature of the ego have seen the reality. They will have no more doubts or anxieties. thought is distracting and strays away from the self. For whom is the body or birth? Not for the self, the spirit. It is for the non-self which imagines itself separate from the self. As there is the sense of separation, there will be afflicting thoughts. If the original source is regained and the sense of separation ends, there is peace. Evaporating and rising into the sky as clouds find no rest till they come back as rain and finally rush back to the sea. The ego can have peace only when it merges back into its source, the self. perceive and experience the one reality in all of them. That is why they have no preferences. Whether one moves about or talks or acts, 
it is all the one reality in which they act or move or talk. The jnani sees nothing apart from the one supreme truth. transcendental awareness I speak of is the natural state, Sahaja Samadhi. Here you are naturally poised. You remain calm and composed even while you are active. You realize that you are moved by the deeper real self within. You have no worries, no anxieties, no cares. Here you realize there is nothing belonging to you. Everything is done by something with which you get into conscious union. being or natural abidance itself is without concepts for in this state the mind is free from doubts it has no need to swing between alternatives of possibilities and probabilities has no active predispositions of any kind. It is sure of the truth. self makes itself felt in the pure mind so that even when you are in the midst of thoughts you feel the presence you realize the truth that you are one with the deeper self and that the thought waves are there only on the surface The heart is the one supreme center of the self. You need have no doubt about it. The real self is there in the heart 
behind the ego self. Self cannot be known with your mind. You cannot realize it by imagination. The only direct way to realize it is to cease to fancy and try to just be yourself. Then you realize or you automatically feel that the center is there. This is the center, the heart of being spoken of in the scriptures as the cavity of the heart. When you go deeper within yourself, you lose yourself in the abysmal depths. Then the reality takes hold of you. It is an incessant flash or current of I consciousness. You can be aware of it, feel it, hear it, sense it. This is what I call self-manifestation. In direct knowing, you can feel yourself one with the one that exists. The whole body becomes a mere power, a force current. Your life becomes a needle drawn to a huge massive magnet and as you go deeper and deeper, you become a mere center and then not even that. For you become a mere consciousness. There are no thoughts or cares any longer. They were shattered at the threshold. It is an inundation. You are a mere straw. You are swallowed alive. But it is very delightful. For you become the very thing that swallows you. This is the union of the individual with the absolute. 